I do want to continue with the series that we started because each one of the lessons on the word of reconciliation is designed to stand alone, but each one of them is connected. And as I told you and probably need to remind you that when we started this, it was sort of to have uh, messages uh, recorded that would sort of stand as tracks on each one of these subjects. And that's the reason we've done them as we've done them. And we'll continue to do for a while. Let me turn back and refresh our memories with what Paul said to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. That's a wonderful passage. It tells us much about the work of the apostles that we spent time on also during the lectureship when it had to do with the work of the Holy Spirit with them primarily to reveal the mind of Christ that we have as the New Testament to us. But also to understand that the apostles had such a peculiar position in the whole scheme of Christianity the design of which is to save us from our sins. Because they are the official representatives of our king who sits at the right hand of God ruling, and thus through them by the power of the Holy Spirit and the baptismal measure of power, they were enabled then to give us, along with those they laid hands on, the prophets, what we have is the New Testament of Jesus Christ. The early church understood that from almost the very beginning, in fact, from the very beginning. For Luke records in Acts 2.42 that the early church continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That's because they were the chosen ambassadors of the court of heaven to earth to give us the authority of our Lord in the words of our Lord where his will is manifested and only where his will is manifested, James 1.25. So this morning, in keeping with this theme of the word of reconciliation, I bring out another topic that's not something that's foreign to faithful children of God who are good students of God's word and rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2, 15, as they study it. But the subject is on repentance. We see a lot of cartoons from time to time and various jokes about repent and this kind of thing. But I know from experience, if I did not know from my own study of God's Word, that when it comes to understanding the Bible, when it comes to believing in Christ with a faith that saves us, when it comes to confessing our faith in Christ and being baptized into Christ, that repentance in the plan of salvation and repentance in the life of a Christian who commits sin is probably the most difficult thing to bring about in people's lives. It is, of course, a condition of salvation that is set out in the word of reconciliation. And every case of conversion, which we've studied in the book of Acts, either by explicit in just so many words or by implication, makes it clear that repentance is a, a part of the scheme of redemption or the plan of salvation. It is absol its absolute necessity is taught amply throughout the Scriptures, both Old and New Testament. On one occasion, Jesus was told of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. 
Now, they were supposed to be great sinners, and that gives us an insight into the way that the Jews of our Lord's day viewed bad things happening to people. They usually attributed it to the fact, well, the fellow deserved it. He was a sinner. You see that attitude going way back in Old Testament history, even by the so-called friends who came to Job trying to convince him that he wouldn't be happening, having all these bad things happen to him if he had not sinned. But bad things can happen to good people. Prime example is our Lord himself. So these folks were said to be great sinners because they suffered such things. But this brought our Lord to say by referring back to these people to the audience that he addressed, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. As they perish, you will perish except you repent, Luke 13, 3. Later on, the great apostle Paul, standing in Athens on the Acropolis, had this to say in his sermon, The times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, Acts 17 and verse 30. I pause here to say it's obvious then that repentance is a command of God. It's something that men must do in order to be saved, even as hearing the word of God and understanding it and having belief in Jesus created by it or the confession of one's faith publicly that Jesus is the Christ. Romans 10.10 10 is necessary. And then to get into Christ and receive the actual remission of sins, being immersed in water by the authority of Christ, into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of sins. So all of these are essential. They're necessary. They're obligatory. The Apostle Peter standing up with the other apostles on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, as Luke records in Acts 2, the day the church began, convicted the Jews mightily with the words of truth that he preached to them. And when they were pricked in their heart, they cried out unto the Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Acts 2.37. And in answer to them as believers in Christ, he declared, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name, which means by the authority of Jesus Christ. Acts 2.38. To be baptized, to be a baptized believer, that is a child of God, who had sinned, that person was told in Acts 8, 22, Simon the former sorcerer, who relapsed, if you please, desired to have the power of the apostles only, had to convert uh, miraculous gifts while laying on of hands. When he requested this, he was told he had no part in a lot in that matter and said, uh, was told, repent therefore of this thy wickedness. And pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Acts 8.22 Well, as there is no man that sinneth not. And repentance is necessary to forgiveness. Surely the question comes to the thinking person. What is repentance? I think in what we've already said and knowing that most here have already studied repentance, are familiar with the term, knowing it's essential to salvation, that we're somewhat more prepared to study it. But there may be those here who really don't understand the New Testament or the Bible doctrine of repentance and its significance. So what is repentance? I think that's a supremely important question that anybody concerned about the forgiveness of sins, becoming a Christian, living the Christian life, and going to heaven eventually would be greatly concerned about. Well, let me say, as I have most often in preaching on it, that repentance is not sorrow for sin on the part of the sinner. That sorrow is not repentance, and it's shown by Paul's own language. He said, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. In other words, this is an action that's necessary and you're not to repent of that thing that is essential, 2 Corinthians 7.10. Now, you'll notice in the verse before this, verse 9, 
Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. Now that tells me that a person can be sorry for his sins, but not necessarily repent. But no one has ever repented that was not sorry for his sins. The sorrow for sins, knowing sins, the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4, is a sorrow toward God. It's godly sorrow. For what? Because you've transgressed his will. And we want to keep that in mind because godly sorrow is the trigger that must be, if you please, squeezed that repentance might take place. There never has been biblical repentance except that one, first of all, has not had sorrow toward God for his sins against God. Never has been. There have been people sorry because they got caught, but given another chance uh, when they think they won't be caught, <laughs> and then they'll try it again. So the sorrow here is sorrow toward God. It must be brought about in you and me, anyone else, in order to become a Christian. But as children of God, when we sin, and this letter was written to children of God, 2 Corinthians, then we must too follow through the same path. Is there something I'm doing contrary to God's will? Is there something I'm leaving undone, a sin of omission? How do we feel about folks who show us that we're simply not living like the New Testament said? Do we love them for showing us an area of our life that's going to keep us out of heaven, that we need to adjust, in effect, that we need to be repenting of. So we need to know that aspect of repentance, that it's not just alone sorrow for sin, but it's godly sorrow, sorrow for our sins against God. We also see that it's not a reformation or a changing of one's life. Reformation of life simply is not repentance. It's the fruit of repentance. And nobody has ever borne that fruit that did not repent any more than a person's repenting that did not have sorrow toward God first for their sins against him. To the Pharisees and the Sadducees who came to his baptism, John the baptizer, the forerunner of the Christ of the Jews, said to them, Bring forth fruit, therefore meet for repentance. Now, that's interesting that he would say that, but he knew them. He knew their hypocrisy. He knew that they were not really believing in him and why he was sent. So he says, why have you come to my preaching? And so bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance. Well, meet simply means suitable. If you've really had whatever repentance is, then you can see it in the way you're going to live after you have repented. Matthew 3.8. Sorrow, repentance, and reformation of one's life are closely connected. And we primarily now break this down for instructional purposes to understand how it all works. It could work very rapidly in a person. Might take longer in some, but nevertheless, we're breaking it down for instructional purposes that it can be easily understood. Now, this relation is plainly indicated by one of the parables of our Lord. In Matthew 21, verses 28 through 30, listen to what he had to say. And he appealed to the people of his day, and so to us, to think about what he said. So he begins by saying, But what think ye? A certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. That tells me somewhat that kids in some stages haven't changed at all in 2,000 years. But afterwards, and this also tells me they haven't changed, he repented and went. And he came to the second and said likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Well, the mind or purpose 
of the first son was not to obey his father. But he became sorry toward his father for that refusal, for that rebellion, for that lack of submission to his own father. And he, of himself, changed his mind or his purpose. And he went ahead and obeyed what his father commanded him to do. Now, the change of will with respect to his father's command in this son's case was his repentance. What affects the change of mind in you or me, whether we're becoming a Christian and obeying the cases or the steps in the plan of salvation, or we're a child of God, like Simon the sorcerer, and we sin? You see, it's something has to break down my stubborn will. And I'm learning from this study that it's my sorrow toward God for having broken His will, for having sinned against Him. And this is the example that we find in the parable the Lord gave. The will of the first son was, well, I'm not going to do it. But He did it. Now, what happened between his not going to do it and his doing it? His will. He submitted his will to his father's will. I hope that in our journey through this study, that one of the things that stands out more and more, and that we learn more about ourselves, that probably the greatest enemy we face is our own free moral agency. We like to do things our way. And that gets us in big trouble because when we are in violation of God's will and maybe the preacher preaches something that says, I'm not right. Or somebody comes to us and talks to us directly and says, you know, this is not the way Christians live, what you're doing. Now, the attitude we have toward God, toward His Word, and toward one who would love us enough to do that is either going to be one of rejection and rebellion and probably anger. Or it's going to be one of, I'm thankful. You see that in David. So, the change of will with respect to his father's command in this son's case was his repentance. And his going and doing were the fruits of repentance. Repentance. Of the reformed life in this case. Godly sorrow works repentance. Which is a breaking down of man's old stubborn will to do things he pleases. And it can be seen in the new creature who's changed his ways to fit God's ways. Now that's so easily said, isn't it? It's very easily said and it's not very difficult to comprehend. But I tell you, friends... It is very difficult in many cases to actually do it. After all, that's why most people are going to lose their souls and they'll sell. They did it their way and tried to defend it and got upset because their way wasn't respected along with any other way. And thus you see the attitude that's existent today that there are many roads that lead to heaven. And you can't find that taught in the Bible. Or we just about nowadays call anything a Christian. And any kind of action or lack of it is considered to be acceptable to God. And man ends up not submitting to anybody. Certainly not to God. From this scriptural illustration... I think it's exceedingly clear, made very plain, that repentance in its strict sense is a change of will that I bring about myself. Others may encourage me to bring that about when they show me why I should and show me from the Scriptures. But I must do it. It is a command of God. But I must do it. 
You know, it's said of Peter in his preaching on the day the church started, and with many other words, he testified and he persuaded them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked or untoward generation. That means the way of salvation has been taught you. But being a free moral agent, you must choose to comply with it. And nobody else can do that for you. There was an old song back, I think, in the 60s, maybe early 70s, country western song, that said you got to walk that lonesome valley. you got to walk it by yourself. You have, in the sense of you and you alone, are the one that must say, I will or I will not do this thing. I control my destiny. I can change my mind. I can be persuaded to change my mind. Or I don't change my mind. Obviously, the thing that ought to be is that truth and only truth and all the truth on a matter should be what changes my mind. And in knowing that truth, I should allow nothing to change my mind from it. But oftentimes we go off the deep end and get mixed up in something that's contrary to the truth of God. But then when we see it, shouldn't we want to change our will back to the will of God? So it's a change of will or purpose on the sinner's part with respect to the commands of God. The relation of repentance to sorrow is simply the relation of effect to cause. And the same is true of the reformed life, the new life, and repentance. The sinner becomes sorrow, sorrowful toward God for his transgression of God's will, his sins, again in violating or neglecting God's laws, I say. He repents, that is, resolves to turn away from whatever the sin or sins may be, and then he resolves to be obedient to God's command. You must do that. I can't do it for you. Your mom and daddy can't do it for you. Your children can't do it for you. Your brothers and sisters can't do it for you. You must in your own mind, in the core of your being, your heart, resolve to do this. This purpose carried out is simply the fruit of repentance born out in your life. Now, from the examples in the book of Acts of conversions to Christ, it's very plainly taught that one can repent in a moment of time. I alluded to that earlier. And that one can even locate this point of time. Many people I've heard tell about their conversion, and they'd say at a given time, I resolve then to be baptized in Christ. I resolve then to make the necessary changes that I needed to make. That I know maybe sometimes they'll say that I need to make for days and weeks and months. But there is a time when you do so. Here arises a question that I think is often a subject of debate, at least among some people who study this subject. Is faith before or after repentance? Well, as repentance occupies a definite point of time, and faith is a continuous thing that I would answer in one way, both. And hear me out on the study of this. When you understand the word of truth and the word of truth is persuaded you through evidence and proper reasoning that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17, it doesn't cease. That faith starts and it continues with you. Right on down through each step in God's plan of salvation. It is from that kind of faith that you pay attention to the other steps in the plan of salvation. The other conditions that you must meet. It springs up when the word of God is received and understood in the very inward man, the heart. And it grows and develops until the day you die or the Lord comes back. As no one can really be sorry for having sinned against God and purpose to cease to do so without believing in Him. So there must be faith before repentance. As it goes to the grave with Him, there is faith after it. Do you think when we see our Lord that our trust in Him will cease or will it be enhanced? 
Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. And now abideth, Paul says, at the end of that great love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, faith, hope, and love. These three. But the greatest of these is love. And some people have wrongly concluded, well, when you see Christ, you won't have faith in him anymore. That's a false concept of faith and knowledge. I'd be like saying I engage in a, let's say, a business deal with you. And we've done all our negotiating through the mail or email or both or telephone. But I've never seen you and you've never seen me. But we've listened to others who knew both of us and they vouched to us that you are trustworthy and given us evidence that proves in other matters you've been very trustworthy. And thus without having ever seen one another in the flesh, we decide that we will trust one another, have confidence and faith in one another that we can carry out this business deal. So we sign all the papers and it's done and we're going to get together and finally meet one another personally because the business deal has been accomplished. And as soon as we see one another, we lose faith in one another. Does that make any sense? If we had faith without sight, then tell me why sight removes faith. It only enhances our faith, brethren. If, the, if a person is worthy of my confidence, trust, faith, and belief in on the basis of evidence before I ever see the person, then why should he lose that because I see him? If anything, it's going to be enhanced, and that's what's going to happen when we see Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, of our faith. So I beg leave to suggest that much valuable time is wasted in discussing such matters as to whether faith precedes repentance or repentance precedes faith. You couldn't have repentance except that you had faith, but faith in the Word of God and what teaches repentance. It's the Word of God. How are you going to repent of your sins, which involves so much effort on your part, when it's sorrow toward God for your sins against God that affects that repentance, if you don't have belief in him in the first place. So I think it has to be that faith precedes repentance. If a man both believes and repents, they come in the right order in spite of any kind of theory man may have to the contrary. He cannot get them wrong if he should try so hard to do so because it's like saying the, I, can, I, can, um, I can run the engine of my car without ever starting it. You're simply not going to render obedience to Acts 17.30 except that faith in Christ which comes by the word of God led you to comply with Christ who said repent. So faith continues right along. And it's out of that faith that we're led to repent. Now the jailer heard the word of God in Acts 16. That's the jailer in Philippi. We studied that case of conversion. He believed because faith comes by hearing the word of God. And the scripture lets us know that he believed and repented in the same hour. In fact, he was baptized shortly thereafter. And that's what's said, isn't it? You are to believe and be baptized. And those people on Pentecost believed because they heard and understood the word. And as believers, they were told to repent and be baptized for their remission of sins. If people would cease to speculate and worry over theories, but do as the jailer did, make a full surrender of his will at once, how much better things would be. Because actually faith is nothing less or more than taking God at his word. One time when we lived in Sperry, Joanne was taking some courses down at... Uh, Northeastern Oklahoma State University, and she was riding with a young lady there in Sperry. And this young lady was very involved in some Pentecostal group. And they were premillennial too. And they had concluded 30 some odd years ago that the Lord was about to come back. And one of the ways that they concluded that the Lord was just about to come back was that buzzards were laying more than the normal eggs in the nest. Because you see, when the Battle of Armageddon takes place, they believe it's the actual battle. 
over there in uh, Palestine that there will be such a slaughter that the blood will to the bridles of the horses. And everybody knows what buzzards eat. And they've got to lay more eggs to hatch more buzzards to eat more people. My comment to Jody when we chuckled about that and then considered how pitiful it was that such who claim to be Christian believe such junk, that if she would just get her head out of a buzzard's nest and into the Bible, it'd make such a great deal of difference. <laughs> now, I say that jokingly, but does that not tell you how far-fetched some people are, and yet they think they are Christians? You know, she would have needed to have repented, wouldn't she, once she came to the proper knowledge of the Bible on those things. And thus her faith would have been right. And if her faith was right, then she would have to adjust her life to be in harmony with her faith. And that would have necessitated sorrow toward God for her sins against Him that moved her to change her mind that she might embrace the truth that she didn't understand. One of the fruits of repentance that needs to be emphasized is not emphasized enough, I don't think, and that is restitution. Restitution. No one can hope for forgiveness until he has, as far as he has in his power. Let me emphasize that. As far as he has in his power. Righted the wrongs he's done. If one has injured another in property or reputation, it's required that he shall restore. As far as it's in his power, I say again, what was wrongfully taken. I fear greatly that we preachers sometimes don't press this point sufficiently. May God help all of us to realize the heinous and hurtful character of sin and the necessity of a repentance that will not lead to a thorough turning away from it. And no one's thoroughly turned away from the sin when they keep the products of the sin. Let me give you a couple examples of the lessons yours. These examples from the Bible are examples of repentance. The prodigal son. We're all familiar with the prodigal son. Luke 15, 11 through 32. This parable is actually given to show God's willingness to forgive. And I do want to emphasize that. You know, God wants to forgive every sinner there is. But we're free moral agents. He made us that way so he can only approach us on that level. We have to choose to turn to Him. It shows our faith in Him and our love of Him. That's the only way I know that a free moral agent can show one's faith in God and His system of salvation. And His love of God is to be able to show it by obedience. The prodigal, having wasted his substance and riotous living, reached a state of abject want. It was then that the Scripture says he came to himself. We would say hit rock bottom. Would to God more people would hit rock bottom. He saw the mistake he made. He realized he had forfeited his right as a son. He became very humble and was willing to become simply a hired servant in his father's house. He was sorry for having even left his father's house. And his resolve of the mind was to go to his father, was to confess that he had sinned against him and against heaven, and simply to be content with being a servant in his father's house. And then he changed his mind, but it seemed to change his life because of a parable, he rises and goes to the Father. And what a thought that was, because you see God's desire to change, that is to forgive the changed person, because when he sees him coming, the Father runs to him. God stands ready to run to every one of us when He sees us sorry, so sorry to Him for our transgression of His will that we change our will and head to do His will, let come what may. He stands ready. As Jesus said, Come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart and you shall find rest unto your soul. There's the mission of Jonah to Nineveh. Jesus said the people of Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah, Matthew 12, 41. Nineveh was a, a great city with a population of perhaps 600,000 or more. No way to know exactly. And they had become exceedingly wicked. 
So much so that God decided to destroy the city. And he commissioned Jonah then to go preach and say, at a certain time, I'm going to destroy the city. And the scripture says, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Jonah's 3, 4. There's his message. But then we see also this, would to God it be that way this day, so the people of Nineveh believed God. The king even came down from his throne and proclaimed a fast, as was typical of the Middle Eastern people. They all put on sackcloth and sat in ashes and cried mightily unto God that they would not be destroyed. And God, seeing the actions that evidenced the repentance that was produced by their sorrow toward God for the sins against him, he didn't destroy them. Now notice, as you look at this, as you examine this in the case of of how repentance was brought about. There was the preaching that was done. The people heard and understood it and believed. They became deeply sorrowful toward God for their wickedness. And they resolved to turn away from it. In every case that's the way it works. And they carried out this resolution. And that they put the violence from their hands. And turned every man from his evil way to God. And here's what our Lord and Savior himself said. They repented. At the preaching of Jonah. Now what moves us. And the lesson will be yours. What moves us to have godly sorrow. That works repentance not to be repented of. If you look at Paul's writing to the church in Rome. In Romans 11 in verse 22. He will speak of beholding the goodness. And the severity of God. If on consideration of God's word of how good he has been to us, we are not moved to have sorrow toward him for our sins against him, which moves us to repent. If that won't do it, then there's the severity of God in that if you sin, you die. God will punish those who die in their sin. So behold the goodness and severity of God. Point here is this. If the truth of God's word about how good God has been to mankind, even when man rebelled against him, and if the truth of God's word of what's going to happen to man if he dies having rejected God's hand through the gospel to forgive him, and dies in his sins, and goes to a devil's hell, if those two things will not bring him to sorrow toward God for his sins, which sorrow works repentance, you cannot bring that person to repentance. There is nothing in the gospel besides those two things to cause one to be sorrowful toward God for his sins against him, which sorrow is essential and works repentance, the breaking down of the old stubborn will of man, the seed of all sin and rebellion against God, so that he will comply with God's will, in this case the gospel of God's power to save, Romans 1.16, or as a child of God and the sins one commits. The process is the same because we're all the same, free moral agents. We work the same way, and the gospel is fitted to us the way God made us, and he doesn't bypass it. And if a fear of going to hell won't change you, or the glories and goodness of God with us here to lead us to happiness beyond the mind to understand in heaven will not change you, you can't be changed. Let that sink in. That should scare anyone here half to death if they're coasting around the edges on thin ice. Rather than listen to me, you want to be thought of as godly and holy and good and the leaven for good, but you can't even get part of the time to church. And if everybody lived like you, there wouldn't be a spring church of Christ. Now, is that bothering you? Or are you sitting there trying to say, well, I have, there's reasons I'm like I am. You know what? It's sad. It breaks my heart as a preacher of the gospel, as a brother in Christ. You're bound to the devil's hell if that's your attitude. And only you can change it. It's going to change because you have faith in God and His will and you behold the goodness and severity of God and then you see yourself honestly and objectively in the light of truth and you want to change your life. You don't want to lose your soul. Now, where are you before God this day? 
Because you may not be back this afternoon. Somebody else at the funeral home will be untying your shoes. I guess I ought to end here. If you need to obey the gospel, will you do it now? If you need to repent of sins as a child of God, will you repent, confess them, pray God for forgiveness? Please repent in the way the Bible teaches it and do so now while we stand and sing.